Power and peace. Power and peace. Once again, we are live with the Black Liberation Movement podcast, Thursday night, 7 o'clock, where we want to bring to you the Black perspective, the clear, the unadulterated, the uncensored Black perspective. We like to say hotel. We have to say Isalam Alaikum. We like to say free the land. We like to say Abar Ghani, yay vote to all of you all out there listening to us tonight. Today we have on deck a very loaded show. The show is loaded and very, very, very impactful, very informative. I would like to ask each one of you to share this broadcast tonight because it's going to be some things said that we really need to hear as a black community. We really need to hear these things as a black community. And tonight, we are not just streaming from our YouTube. We're not just streaming from our social media page. We are also streaming from Philadelphia, PA, live on Time for an Awakening broadcast. Okay? These are some strong brothers up there that have been picking up on what it is that we're doing down here in Mississippi and Mississippi on the move as orchestrated by the Black Liberation Movement, grassroots leadership here in Mississippi. Uh, I am your brother, Patrick Lumumba, Chief Organized Facilitator of the Mississippi-based Black Liberation Movement. Along with us, we have our sister secretary, Sister Crystal Denise. We also have our young brother, powerful young brother that head up our BYLC, our Black Youth Leadership Coalition. That's brother Jahi Ashe. And we also have with us our illustrious Baba, our Council General, Baba Kamal Kareem. And we do have with us today a strong brother of the NAACP, Brother Charles Motley of the NAACP. He's going to share with us also today. Uh, and we also have tuning in, flanking us from across the nation. Brothers and sisters, as powerful as our brother, Professor Carl Tone Jones, with the Independence Day Project, our brother that's been a member with the Black Liberation Movement for so long, uh, and he's, he's been connected with us. And we also have our brothers from Columbus, Mississippi, our powerful political family belonging to Baba Kamal Kareem, uh, Kareem and Company. And we have our sister, Beth Johnson. So thank y'all for tuning in tonight. I want to prelude this show uh, with the uh, the title of this show, the topic that we are going to talk about tonight. Very pressing, very relevant topic. Our topic for tonight is justice, re justice reform in Mississippi, the new paradigm of a black reality. Justice reform in Mississippi, the new paradigm for the black reality. Internalize that if we go into this conversation. Again, we ask that you share this broadcast. We need to get this critical conversation to as many ears as possible across this nation. So use our social media platform effectively and let's get this message out. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead on and bring on Baba Kamal uh, Kareem because we got an action-packed show and we got to start unloading this thing. Baba Kamal, how are you doing today? Oh, doing fine to all of our listeners. Uh, we want to say Ashe Hotep and thank you for tuning in to our brothers, our good brothers out there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you and keep up the good work. And to all of our cadres and everyone listening, uh, it's, it's good to be here and good to be in the name of work for uh, Black liberation for our people. Uh, very good, unique title for tonight. And I like that word paradigm. In order for us to understand where we are, we have to understand how we've come uh because we have a problem amongst us and as i was mentioning before we came on the air 
we've got to get rid of Stephen and Stephanie. And I'll explain what that is. But, you know, we have a gross misinterpretation of freedom. Freedom and liberation is not the same thing. You know, when we were slaves and we were in the South, you know, we did a migration to remove ourselves from physical abuse, murder, lynching, rape. And then once we did that great migration, which all of us didn't migrate, but 7 million of us did, when we did that paradigm shift, then we asked to be uh, accepted, to participate, to have a job, mm -hmm. we wanted to have a house. We wanted, But then we moved from that, we wanted to integrate. And mind you, along the way, each time we were asking for these things, we were going off the path of our revolutionary heritage. Then we have moved from the integrate, uh, just can I have a job? Uh, can I go to school with you? Now can I marry you? And uh, uh, can I be accepted by you in this kind of way? And even if we we see currently uh, to rise in the Biden administration, one of the, one of the things that you have to do is uh, you have to be either married to a white woman or a white man, and that mm -hmm. will get you recognition in the Biden administration. Then we move from that and we're in a period of assimilation. And this period of assimilation is uh, you're not supposed to acknowledge racism unto you. You're not supposed to acknowledge your own humanity. You're not supposed to acknowledge that you are African or come from the original peoples of the earth. <clears throat> you're not supposed to talk about black history. You're not supposed to talk about black history in school. You're supposed to be an American. You're supposed to be ashamed to be who you are. <clears throat> And this has caused a disconnect, a total disconnect of cognitive dissonance among us. Those that don't know what cognitive dissonance is, that's a psychological term where you're disconnected with reality, the truth of your time of day in which you should be in. No doubt. No doubt, Baba. I was just sitting here taking notes as you were talking. And uh, I got some things that I want to come back to that you were just expressing. But before we do that, I want to try to stay on task with this show. I do want to acknowledge a very powerful brother that uh, is on the show. Sister Bev Johnson made me understand in the comments that brother Kazim Zulu Rock is on this show. Uh, that brother is responsible for the Black Panthers even existing in Mississippi. Okay? He's responsible for the Black Panthers even existing in Mississippi. So I want to give a strong shout out, a strong ashe to that brother. You know, that brother help has fallen or somewhat, but at the same time, uh, that brother is still strong and still very supportive of what it is that going on in Mississippi. And he is the causative effect of, of what is going on in Mississippi in so many ways. So I want to make sure that I give a shout out to that brother, brother Kazim Zulu Rock. But let's press on. Now, Baba Kamal and everybody that's on, <clears throat> I think that word paradigm is very important. And I want to make sure that we understand because I've been hearing all for the last 10 years the conscious community of black people, the thinkers, you know, the information people, the knowledge pushers, the knowledge pontificators, I call them. Uh, been talking about in concept a paradigm shift a paradigm shift so what we want to do we want to explain exactly what a paradigm is we don't want to be long about it. uh sister crystal could you put up that definition of paradigm so we can be clear paradigm shift Sister Gwen Singleton, while she's doing that, I want to make sure that I give you a shout out, Queen Mother. Uh, she was out at the town talk, Baba Kamal, in Natchez, Mississippi. Oh, Queen yeah. Mother, Gwen yeah. Singleton, was out at the. We want to give you a shout out. Thank you for tuning in tonight and sticking along with the Black Liberation Movement, uh, Miss Singleton. We appreciate you just like we appreciated you tonight. You showed up at that town talk. So thank you for tuning in and staying with us. So did we get the definition up? We're trying to get. I uh, trust that if we don't get it, 
Brother Lumumba has it on deck. I have it in my own file. So it looked like it's taken. Okay, here it is. There it is. Yeah, we're going to let the white man tell us what it is. Okay? We're going to let the white man tell us what paradigm is. It's a typical example, a pattern of something, a model, a model. Now, it gives a little example right there, but I'm going to read it one more time. It says, a typical example, a pattern of something, a model. Now, how does that apply <clears throat> to what it is we're talking about? Well, let's shift the definition just a little bit, Bob Kamal, and those that listen. I'm going to do it from a social standpoint, okay? A paradigm is a social normalcy. Uh, we could say the way that things are, the way that they have been, and the way that they are expected to continue to be, okay? That's a paradigm. So when black folk talking about shifting the paradigm, we talking about shifting the social normalcy of the way that things are. So when we look at the paradigm right now, we're looking at the conditions of black people. We're looking at the, the, the suffering of black people. We're looking at black people being terrorized, black people being underrepresented, black people being miseducated. We're looking at all those things. This is a normalcy with our people. So when we're talking about shifting the paradigm, what are we talking about? We're talking about changing the social normalcy of our condition. I just tried to make that as clear as possible. So the paradigm is such that Claude Anderson said, we have been deemed and determined a permanent underclass in this society. Okay, so when we're talking about just the reform in Mississippi, uh, Baba Kamal, I hope you hear me, uh, Brother Charles Motley. When we're talking about justice reform in Mississippi, and we're talking about a new paradigm, we're talking about shifting that normalcy, shifting the conditions of black people, changing it, changing it. So what we, when we're talking about power, and that's what we're talking about, black power today, and Baba Kamal, I would uh, not be reluctant to say that we have stepped into the paradigm. We probably the first organized effort and what it is that you crafting right now, what it is that we have idealized in our mind that we most definitely willing to carry out. We are the next power, black power movement in Mississippi since Kwame Toure and Mikasa Dada Ricks announced the Black Power Movement in Greenwood, Mississippi in 1969. I want people to understand that. What we're doing on the ground right now with the Black Liberation Movement and all cadres that surround this particular comprehensive objective that we're about to embark upon is probably the only black power movement since 1966. So, Baba Kamal, and we need to bring uh, Brother Charles Martin on. Baba Kamal, speak to that reality and maybe yeah. what it is that we're doing. Go ahead and bring uh, Brother Charles Martin on. Yeah. Uh, well, brothers and sisters, in, uh, in, in 1966, the same uh, social conditions injustice, uh, murder, and inequality existed in Mississippi in 1966 as it does in 2022. Uh, my case in point, uh, not only mentioning the Emmett Till fiasco of what happened to us in LaFleur County, where you had numerous Black jurors who was a majority of that grand jury that convened that got in the way of their own freedom justice and equality but um uh eight lynchings since 2001 unsolved mm -hmm. law enforcement misconduct and murder racist police chiefs poison water systems uh the refusal of this state government to acknowledge uh, even federal funds that could come to help and aid 
poor and disenfranchised people and those same officials taking that money and squandering it on luxury items, uh, violent policies being passed toward black people. So uh, what you're witnessing and what we're witnessing is a reemergence of people who are sick and tired of being sick and tired in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, who don't know the knowledge of themselves and don't or have not been able to define their own reality, who wish to do so and who wish to emerge not as a permanent underclass, but to emerge from that class to determine their own destinies. And this is what we're participating in right now. Hmm. No doubt. No doubt, Father. So <clears throat> that capitulated leadership that we've been <coughs> going and traversing the state of Mississippi. We've been going and traversing the state of Mississippi, going into predominant predominantly black township. We're very specific about where we're going because at some point, Bobby, we're going to have to determine where we're going to reside. You know, we're going to have to determine that just like white people, the European, he determined that he was going to reside somewhere and he was going to make a place his own, crafted in his culture, crafted in his power, oblivious to any other culture, oblivious to any other power. He determined a destination, a place, land, and he began to create the reality that we have today. So at some point, black people are gonna have to make a mature decision where we're gonna reside. So, you know, it's clear to me that we gotta find spaces where we already at. You know, where we already control that people have determined disenfranchised places. You know, when we think about Mississippi, and I talk to these brothers all over the nation, uh, 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 Brother Kamal and uh, Brother Char, talk to brothers all over the nation. And there's a sentiment that goes along with Mississippi. You know, it's a sentiment of the back door, retarded, slow, uh, underdeveloped black man. But see, it's a, it's a very different reality that comes along, too, and it's a narrative that's not getting expressed right. about, and, about the DNA. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, but and, and if I may say so, in this paradigm shift right now, we are in a struggle with our own people. And if I can use the analogy, uh, there's a hole in the fence on the plantation. We're leaving out the hole, but Stephanie and Stephen wants to fix the hole so that they can stay. Right. That's what we encountered in LaFleur County with this grand jury and passing this negative, negative impact in, as far as this warrant not being executed and justice being shelf life. Uh, this mm -hmm. is what we have in capitulated leadership all throughout the state with our own black leaders some of them are satisfied just by their own personal access and don't want to do nothing for their people. And mm -hmm. so uh, one of our initiatives in this rise to self-awareness, self-determination and black power uh, through our black liberation is our political initiatives to get rid of that and those who do not have a sociological and biological interests of our community we're on election cycle right now and and we have already started whether it be judge races or whether it be county supervisors or representatives or state senators but to go through the whole 82 county gambit of mississippi and see who is representing the sociological biological economical educational interests of our community and if they're not doing that to get rid of them mm -hmm. so good deal bob so uh <clears throat> we have brother charles motley of the naacp chapter in sunflower county if i'm not mistaken i'm allowing him to introduce himself but he called me earlier this week and he expressed two very interesting uh things to me earlier this week he called me he said brother patrick how you doing uh I said, I'm fine, brother. How you doing? He said, well, I'm good. 
He said, are you aware? No, no, no. First thing he told me, he said, I had a conversation with Mr. Dwayne Richardson today. And I thought that was very interesting. For those who don't know, Mr. Dwayne Richardson uh, was is the DA, you know, in the full county that was responsible, in my opinion, of fumbling opportunity to bring and champion the cause of justice to our people. Bringing a measure of justice to our people. Let's not mistake this Emmett Till situation and say, you know, bringing justice to the Emmett Till family. You know, that's a very small microscopic way of looking at this thing. You know, and I think white supremacists get away with that every time with these injustices where they isolate us into families, individual families. No, this is an attack on black humanity. And that's what I try to express so many times. It, has, it is an attack on black humanity. When they marginalize us and, 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 and dissect us down to just individual families, and we don't understand that we are collectives that have been abused for a duration of time, then that's where they win it because we don't understand our collectiveness and, and, and who we are. So it was very interesting, the conversation that uh, Mr. Motley had with uh, Dwayne Richardson, who decided to show up at the courthouse and do his job all of a sudden, okay? But the two visits that we were down there looking for him, he never was there, okay? So, yeah, this, this grand jury was convened basically secretly and came back with no indictment for that lady who's hanging back there on my wall beside Chuck Way Lumumba, a real black leader, beside Malcolm X, a real black leader. I still feel justice should be brought to her, and we're going to do what's necessary. So let's bring Brother Charles Motley on. Brother Charles, can we get a video of him? Brother Charles, you on? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. How y'all doing today? How y'all doing? How you yeah, doing, okay. Brother Charles? Glad Patrick invited me to be on tonight. It's just uh, so important, you know, especially during this time after Emmett Till, been six to seven years with no justice. Had a conversation with uh, Dwayne Richardson on, uh, I think that was Monday, yeah, Monday at the board meeting. And uh, <clears throat> I was walking down the stairs while he was getting out of his, his vehicle, and we talked about 25 to 30 minutes. And one thing he did tell me, he said, Charles, we had 18 blacks and four whites on the grand jury, and we could not get a conviction. He said the uh, deliberation lasts about, he said about eight hours. And uh, like I told Patrick, if you had to be conditioned uh, from history to learn about how Emmett Till left this earth six or seven years ago, you had no business being on the grand jury anyway because everyone knows uh, how Emmett Till left the first in 1955. And they didn't need to be educated. Only thing they had to do was vote the right way. And I was, you know, I was real disappointed in the way they voted along with millions and millions of blacks and white people live in America because we had our opportunity. God gave us that opportunity. That day was predestined. He gave us another opportunity to uh, get some justice for the Emmett Till family. And the black people live across America. And it did not happen. What I see going on now uh, is just cycle. We're going through the same thing we went through in the 50s and the 60s, where Emmett Till got killed in the uh, 50s. And we had an all-white grand jury. And we still couldn't get a conviction then. And we didn't get one two weeks ago. And so the same thing happened to our peoples, our blacks in America. We've been shot down by policemen at all times. Uh, in material was 14, Trayvon Martin was 15, Tamir Rice was 12. The same thing went on in, in 55. 
is going on in the 21st century where we have evidence, overwhelming evidence, and we could not get a conviction. When is this going to stop? Uh, as we go to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, we're still going in cycles. Same thing happening now about the George Floyd police reform. That was part of the Civil Rights Act back in 1964. We're still going in cycles. Same thing about the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Right now, uh, Biden been trying to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Well, it, it was passed one time back in 1965. It, as we all can remember, in 2013, uh, 5B of the Voting Rights Act was gutted when there was no longer pre-clearing was required for the states that are in the South. The 11 states that was had to get pre-clearance before we have every election. We're going through the same cycle that we did back then. We're going through it right now. So you said a par we, we have a paradigm shift, but if, it, if it's shifting the right way for our people to come out of the hole that we've been in ever since really we've been in America, because the blacks, we have done a, a lot of great things here in America, but we have not reached a pinnacle where we know that blacks want to achieve every day. So what do we have to do to get it over to the elected leaders? And what do we have to do to get it over to our black neighborhood where we're going to have to do things for ourselves and to stop destroying our own community? Mm. Well, you know, uh, yeah, and, and, and I, I just got two before I relinquish. Uh, the first comment in response to my dear beloved brother, the NAACP, you know, uh, true power is being able to define your own reality and make other people accept it as their own. And that's something that we have not been doing. And that's something that we're going to have to attempt to do with an elimination of this miseducation of our people. Right now, our people are ashamed of who they are. and They want to be something that they're not. And as long as a people uh, do not know who they are or have a cultural connectivity broken, they cannot properly attain growth and development. So this is where we're at right now. Uh, and as I mentioned to uh, 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 Commander Lumumba, you know, uh, 70% of our African American population is under the age of 40. And so there's some terrible things going on with this large population of young people. Uh, the music is deliberately made bad to keep them in a thug life, to keep their behaviors, to feed the prison industrial complex, so on and so forth. So we're going to have to go through a process to understand what's happening to us. The second thing is, one of my brothers from Kareem and Company, he made a statement that ran across there. He asked a good question, said, uh, how can you get justice for, uh, uh, what are your active plans for justice reform of a system that was never intended to include black people and was designed not to include black people? Well, uh, we don't have any other choice but to take a page out of uh, our brother uh, Malcolm's book and our brother Kwame Torrey's book. And it's this, it's the ballot or the bullet. Right now we go through the process because we're civilized, peace loving people. We go through the process. Uh, take for instance, just like uh, the, all of this injustice that's going on in the state of Mississippi. Well, we're gonna have to break the norm in order to continually cause the paradigm shift to draw attention nationally to the travesty of what's going on in Mississippi, not just Emmett Till, but also with the eight lynchings that have been unsolved since 2001, all of this law enforcement and government corruption, all of these murders where law enforcement hide behind qualified immunity. Uh, you given a brother life without the possibility of parole for 1.5 ounces of marijuana. 
we're going to have to start calling out that which has been hidden in plain sight. And, and, and as Dr. Uh, uh, Joyce de Greer says, we're going to have to heal post-traumatic slavery disorder. Post-traumatic slavery disorder. This is what we suffer from. So we got to do these things simultaneously. Uh, and, and if I might say so, one of the plans is right now is, is not to let this go, not to let the Emmett Till Initiative go or justice reform, but to press forward, not only by having this rally on August the 26th at 2 p.m., right in their face, right in front of uh, the attorney general's office, but also to make the right preparatory documents for a proper congressional inquiry for the state of Mississippi. I respect Congressman Benny Thompson, love the work that he does, but he's only one man. One man cannot see everything hidden in plain sight. Attention of this has to be brought to bear for the whole nation, the whole United States of America needs to know that Mississippi and America is not upholding its 2008, 2009 apology for slavery. It's not acting upon the United Nations report on what to do about systemic racism, 2017, 2018. And we have to make the nation aware about Mississippi and at the same time, educate our people not to be afraid. Our people are scared. We're scared of white folks. We're scared of reprisal. We're scared yeah. of losing our job. That's the first thing we holler. I'm going to lose my job. We're, we're scared. Preachers are scared. Politicians are scared. And we've got to initiate that revolutionary heritage and that fearlessness, that fearlessness that we had in back in 1966, 1968, through the 70s, where we cared about our community. And when something was wrong, we did something about it. No doubt. And Brother Motley, thank you, Baba Kamal, because you always bring clarity to our uh, conversation. But I'm just looking at the face of Brother Motley. I see something on the tip of his tongue, and I want him to get that off. But I want to respond to some things, and I want to be clear. You know, because I'm, I'm not saying that I'm some special person, but I am saying this. I feel that our ancestors and the history of our people uh it exudes through me. I feel that. And I'm going to say something right now. I, I'm going to say something right now. The Black Liberation Movement is on record of saying this right here. And I want people to think about this. White people do not abandon their culture when they ascertain power. Okay? White people do not abandon their culture, who they are, their culture, their values, their norms, when they ascertain power. Why you say that, Brother Lumumba? Well, let's go back to the Emmett Till situation and what the highest prosecutor in the land said. Uh, uh, Lynch. What, what was her name? Uh, Lynch. Whatever her name is. Yeah, uh, said, Lynn, Lynn Finch. Lynn Finch, right. What she said, Brother Martin, she said, I will not prosecute this case. She said, I will not prosecute this case. So what, what was she really saying? What she really was saying, why would I do that to my grandmother? Why would I do that to my grandmother? OK, what I'm saying is that white people, look at the laws that are crafted in this country. And, and Crystal, get that, that video ready. Get that video of Sharon Flowers read. Look at the laws that are crafted in this country that are put into order that create the social normalcy or the, the, um, the, the paradigm. I'm talking about the laws that create the paradigm. And tell me one law that goes against the quality of white life. So if you can't find a law on the book, on record, that goes against the quality of black life, I mean, of white life, I'm, excuse me, of white life, because there's plenty of laws that goes against the quality of black life. 
if you can't find a law that goes against the quality of white life, then that means that white people politics are designed to maintain the quality of their life. Okay? So when we ascertain power, I'm talking about black people, and I'm being clear, I ain't been to none of y'all institutions. I'm talking about none of these places where we feel like we have to go to get qualified to lead the black community. Okay? I ain't been to none of them. And I'm glad. Because I'll be a long time getting to this point that I'm at. That I feel black people across Mississippi should start to feel swell in their belly, in their hearts, in their mind. I'm talking about when are you going to take your reality to your seats of power? We don't identify with our blackness. Now, Brother Molly, you told me right over this bluff right here, right over this bluff, the Congressional Black Caucus is convened right now. Right somebody now. called me. Somebody called me from the, the casino hotel Gold Strike and said, uh, Brother Patsy, do you know that the, the uh, isn't the, some, uh, I said the Congressional Black Caucus, yeah, they they marching up in. I said, yeah. So what they see? What do they see? I'm going to tell you what they see, what it sounds like to me. Sound like some dignified Negroes is walking up in to the Gold Strike Casino Hotel Resort with their suits on that's paid for by our black dollar. And they don't represent one, us one eye older. A serious and consequential black cause. They don't represent one hour. Old. Okay? That's something that we should be irate about. Now, Lamoon, I'm gonna say this, and I'm done. People often tell me, well, I don't I don't I ain't got nothing against white people. I just got something against the system. That's one of the most silly statements I ever heard. Systems come out of the minds of men. They want to create a system. <clears throat> okay, that's simple, but see that capitulation. So when 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 Mr. Uh, when Mr. Ritz told you that that grand jury was composed of, well, I don't know what you said, six an uh, overwhelming amount of black people. See that capitulation. Eighteen blacks, four whites. Eighteen blacks and four whites. See, I know something about grand juries. See, grand juries are different from petite juries. Okay. These grand juries are convened in secret, and they convened by people that you don't know. They, 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 I, I mean, you know them, but you don't know that they've been convened. They are influential black people. So what we got with influential black people? We got also capitulated black people. We got black people that don't identify with black people. They don't identify with the suffering of black people. Okay? That's what we got. That's what we got. Mr. Motley, your organization is full of them. And yes. I have come across very few that's like you. The NAACP is full of them type of black people. Okay? And I'm going to say this and I'm done. Because I want us to see real black leadership taken to a power position. We have very few examples of this, Baba Kamal, this video that we're about to show. You know, this video that we're about to show. But it's something that touched my heart. About three years ago, Miss Sharon Flowers of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, a state senator, when she stood and she took her blackness with her, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't become oblivious of the fact that she was black when they were trying to make these laws. She made them understand that I'm not leaving my blackness because I'm sitting up here with all these white folks. You understand? I represent black people and I got a black son. See, we abandoned that. And I got a serious problem with that. We have to have a serious problem with that. You talking about we keep on revisiting the civil rights bill and these smoke screens that they keep blowing up our ass? They keep blowing political smoke screens up our ass. The Emmett Till uh, anti-lynching bill. But then Dunham Walk. In the same in the same breath, you know the Civil Rights Act, the John Lewis Act. They they named it right. It's an act, and what they what do people do when they put on move? They acting. 
That's what it is, an act. It ain't nothing serious. You know, something to pacify black people. But what I want us to see right here, I want us to see what I mean by non-capitulated black leadership. Black leadership that goes into the hall of these lynching trees, these white lynching trees. And I want to see somebody, I want to see, I want us to see somebody put a stop to that in his track and what real courage look like. And once you do this, this should get contagious. Okay. And, and I actually attempted to bring Sharon Flowers to the Black Liberation Building Power Summit that particular year, but I was unsuccessful in doing that. But she inspired me. And I want us to see this video uh, right here. And, and this happened about three years ago. But let, let, let's tune in to real black leadership. Click the sound. Turn it, you need to stop. No, I don't. Turn it, you need to stop. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, what the hell are you gonna do? Shoot me? It doesn't take much to look on the local news every night and see how many black kids, black boys, black men are being killed with these stand your ground defenses that these people raise, then they get So I take issue with that. I'm the only person here of color. Okay, I am a mother too. And I have a son. And I care as much for my son as y'all care for y'all's. But my son doesn't walk the same path as yours does. Debate deserves more time. I'm in Pine Bluff. We have killings regularly down there. Mr. Hunter. Now, I don't know where the heck, I know where you are from. I really where Mr. from. But I can tell you. And for a long time, I have feared for my son's life. Now, he's 27, and he's out of Arkansas. And I, it offends me. And then to limit the debate, you don't have to worry about your children, Will. I worry about about us boys else. into my neighborhood, into my city. Open carry on office in front of the court. Do I have right for him? Person walking around with a Some of y'all walking around here up in the legislature. His name down here with a damn gun in it. You can see the damn print. Central. Senator. I'm telling you. Bills that Alec have and all that stuff. I'm talking about my son's life. I'm talking about the lives of other black kids. You want to do Gun out in the chamber today.
All right, go ahead and stop me, quick. Because <clears throat> walking around with guns Hold on your hip and under your coat, and you can see the imprint, it's threatening. Thank yes, you. sir. Okay. Now, I, I, I apologize for the breakup in that video, and I think it's due to the fact that we do have, you know, multiple uh, out, out, outlets here, you know what I'm saying? But I wish we could have hear, heard it clear, but I think we got the gist of what was taking point. place. You got the point? I, got I hope we got the point. Now, how often do we see that? You know, how often do we see black politicians take their blackness and identify with it and utilize their power? She stopped that bill. She stopped that bill. So in stopping that bill, we need to understand the magnitude of this. Because, see, I have been on the side of, well, I'm not dealing with no electoral politics, period. Okay? I'm going to stick to the indigenous side. But I understand that these people actually shape our social dynamic. When you can pass a law called Stand Your Ground, which basically means if white people feel uncomfortable, they can kill your ass. Now, let me say, your black ass. Okay? They can kill you. That's a law. Stand your ground. Who they talking to? Why are we acting like we not seeing this? Why are we walking around here in our suits and ties acting like we not seeing this? But see, I'm thankful for Miss Flowers because Miss Flowers did not abandon her blackness. She did not abandon the fact that she is a mother that has a black son. White folks are not abandoning their whiteness when they get this power. They're not. So at what point are we going to have these conversations with the educated Negroes, Mr. Motley? What point are we going to have this conversation with these Negroes? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I like what you said earlier. Uh, ascertain power, and they never come back to the black communities and, and share the power, and then show them how to rise up from the things that have been keeping us down for so long. We have people right here in Sunflower County in, uh, in Inanola, Mississippi. They have gone to the legislator and surrounding counties to come back and, and they do absolutely anything, nothing in our community. Taxation without representation. We've been hearing that all our life. So we, we got to hold our black sister and brother accountable when they go to Washington, when they go to Jackson, even on the school board, aldermen, board of supervisors, we got to hold them accountable. Call them in, set them down, and see what they are doing to improve the communities in which they represent. And most of the time, it's nothing. Well, you know, it starts with one original statement in terms of who we are. Who is the original man? The original man. It's the black man, right. maker, the owner, cream of the planet Earth, God of the universe. It starts with that. If if we can internalize that, then our self worth will increase. As long as we out here and disconnected from that, there is no progress. There will be no community development. There will be no individual development because you have to have a connection to who you are yourself. And for 400 years, we have not had that. In Mississippi, we have not had that. Mississippi is like the bowels, being in the bowels of the wilderness of North America. And we down here in the bowels, in the, in the balls of the beast. And what we're saying in this new movement, this new resurrection is, let's kick them in the nuts. Let's draw mm -hmm. attention to what we have to do. See, let's act out the process so that we can clear the way to have sociological and biological interests to protect, to protect and defend. And so this is what we're striving for, but it all starts with that original statement. It starts with us trying to tell our people, stop trying to be something that you're not. Stop acting out this xenophobic type behavior, you know, uh, walking down the street with uh, 
blue eyeballs and blonde hair and pants all down around your behind and whatnot. And so you have to understand the population, the young population that is 40 and under, which is 70 percent of us. Those are the ones that are being attacked right now so that they will not do for themselves so that they'll be locked up in the prison industrial complex so that they'll be hooked on drugs uh, so that they'll they'll be sick and, and fall victim uh, to this system. Because once they get the knowledge of themselves, once they learn combined operation, brother, they will become the most dangerous people in the world as it relates to white supremacy. Mm. Right. So, yeah. so, brother, drama proof, I do see you, brother. I know I had what we talked about, and we're going we're gonna to get that in. But I'm thinking that it's going to be a good show for another show. We're gonna do the we're gonna do a show just on me and you. Because what brother what brother drum proof is so chomping at the bit to get on this show about, he wanted to talk about brother uh uh the Yuhuru uh 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 socialist African socialist party that had been attacked yeah. a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis. And what he wanted to do, he wanna tie it in to what it is that we do that we going through right here in Mississippi. So it is relevant my brother it is relevant and we're gonna get to that and i think it deserves a whole show in it in itself but what i want to say is as, as these negroes convene over here on our dime okay brother Martin, you say you're yep. over there sad as these negroes convene over here on our dime okay on our dime who paying for the hotel room who paying for the drinks and the shots that they're about to take over there. Baba Kamal, we talked about. We know what they're finna do over there. Okay? What they gonna actually do? What's gonna be consequential out of that? You know? Because we have not created yet. I never forget the question. When we was down there on the yard down in Greenwood, Mississippi, that the young lady reporter, young black reporter asked me. She said, I wanna get a young person's perspective on this whole Emmett Till situation. And I and I said, well, there ain't none out here. <laughs> she she couldn't find no young people. Bob Kamal, she could not find no young people. You were there, Brother Martin. You were yes. the only representation of a formal organization, okay, out there, okay? I had to respond to that young lady in that presentation that I made. And I told her, I said, we have not crafted that generation yet right we have not crafted that generation of young people yet okay mm -hmm. see our young people waiting on the movie to come out so we can get all emotional but see white supremacy that are already politicized and moved on this thing they done already slammed the doors of justice on it so now when teal come out baba kamal october the first when teal come out it's going to fill black people with emotion. Three generations of black people that don't, they just know of Emmett Till. They don't know the story. So it's going to fill up with emotion and, 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 and charge us up. But the political move been made. But see, we got to create a political move. And, and, and Brother Kareem asked a great question. Put that question back up when he was talking about the system. Uh, I think that Brother Ahmad. Yeah, he's talking about the system. Let me, I see Brother Carl. I'm going to put this up right quick. Okay, he said, "What? No, 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 not that one. The one before. I had it up there. What? Uh, what? What? I got. I got it right there." He said, "What are your active plans for justice reform of a system that was never intended to include black people and was designed not to include black people?" Well, see, the thing is, we're not trying to change that system. We're trying to build a system. Justice reform. To me, is not begging white people to do something that they already decided not to do. They already yeah. decided not to do that. So what we're talking about is building a system of functionality among black people where we control politics. See, we control these places that we've been going. These spaces that we've been going in, we actually control them. I told the mayor down there in Columbus, Mississippi, I said, you know something? I'm talking to the mayor, the white mayor in Columbus, Mississippi, 
a predominantly black township. I said, we'd have been the sixth city. This is the sixth one. And you the first white man told him that. I don't owe him shit. I don't owe him no allegiance. You the first white man. You lucky. You lucky that you have black people that don't understand how to control their community. You lucky. I told him that. You know why? Because I'm the chief organized facilitator of the black liberation movement. That ain't no game to me. See, we all playing political uh, games. You know, Malcolm said, you playing political games. I told him, I said, you the first white mayor of a predominantly black township. That's interesting. And you stand up here and you say, we got to police our own community. Okay, what you mean by that? Because at first I thought you were about to say something, white man. But you ain't saying shit, but the same thing that white people been saying. This is what you said. You said, let's continue to funnel money into the police. So we can do what? Police y'all niggas. That's what I read. Some of y'all might be smarter than me, but that's all I read. And you know what we did? We sat there quiet as church mice. We sat there quiet as church mice and listened to the only white person there. But when Baba Kamal gets up, we want to go back to playing music, cranking our motorcycles up. No, nah, that's not going to take place. Hold on, Baba Kamal. We need to hush these people because they need to give you the same respect that they just gave their white men. You feeling me, Brother Martin? Yes. That, that's what I'm talking about. That's how that's that psychosis that when Bob, when Brother Carlton Jones came down here uh, six years ago and he said to me, coming from Philadelphia, Mississippi, he said, man, I've been conceptualizing and theorizing black townships. He said, we already got them. He was standing in Coldwater, Mississippi. He said, the only thing is we need to terraform the mindset. We need to terraform the mindset. So Mississippi on the move, that's what we're doing. We're talking about going into black township and creating the thought. How do we control our own demographics? How do we do that? Are we bold enough to do that? So yeah, that's what we at. That's what we at. Anybody? To all of all of our cadres, and when I say cadres, I mean those movements, maybe not necessarily that belong to black liberation, but we all have the same purpose. Let us be like one body. You know, the foot don't look like the head and the heart don't look like the stomach, but it all has one purpose, and that's to keep the body alive. This is about the survival of our people. And in Mississippi, I ask whether you be NAACP or Nation of Islam, whether you be Black Power Coalition or New Black Panther Party, uh, whether you be Christian or Muslim, Jew, Gentile, Israelite, the question of our humanity and our survival is at stake and we need to unite and I ask that September 16th in Senatobia, Mississippi, if you able, that you come, that we converge, that we uh, leave with a strategized plan to get uh, these things done, to get this congressional inquiry done, to uh, get this justice initiative done, to uh, maintain people on the ground, to get rid of this black capitulated leadership in these various counties, and to politically uh, educate our people and to educate our people uh, academically about themselves so that we can uh, lift each other up because um, our people are suffering for a lack of knowledge. See, it's a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge in Mississippi as to who we are and what we should do. Right now, all over this country in America, you know, uh, black men and women are confused about what to do. What our beloved brother from the NAACP said is true. We Like we're going around in a circle like a dog chasing his tail around and around. We've been down this road before. 
jobs and justice been down that road voting rights been down that road police killing our people we've been down that road and right now uh either a person has given up uh uh, doped out, uh, partied out, drunken out, or uh, 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 act like they don't care. But we have to bring to bear that this is about the sociological and biological interests of our people. And we have to keep pressing. Now, everybody's not going to come on board, but for those who are dedicated to Black power and liberation, please hear us and help us. Not just uh, up here being a talking head, but to get out there and to do something. Because I tell you, we're going through the process now. But don't think you're going to get out of this without somebody getting scuffed up. Don't think that this is going to happen or transpire without some blood being shed. Because I'm, I'm here to tell you, just as what goes around comes around, if you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, look at what happened yesterday. This white man is not going to go away quietly. He's going to leave kicking and screaming. And when he kicks and screams, he's going to try to take everybody with him. He's going to do whatever he can to stop us from getting our true liberation, our true freedom, justice, and equality. So we're just going, we're, we're laying down the groundwork. If you will, rules of engagement is what we're doing because we're doing it in a respectable manner. We're asking every power that is to bear that this is the injustice that's going on, this you're killing our people, that we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that we're issuing this ballot because what comes next is what? Oh, and we have excellent. to be real about this situation. Yes, sir. Excellent. excellent. That will come next. Uh, when we're in the uh, national, we met in uh, uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey in July, our theme was that that's power. That means that all the 12,000 people that were there for the, uh, the NAACP convention this year, the theme was that is power. All, you know, all the blacks that convened there. But the thing about it is, what do we do when we leave there? Are we going to implement these policies that we learned in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and take them back to our community? How many people can we raise up like Congressman Thompson here in the state of Mississippi? How can we raise up our leaders? What, what do we have to do to make sure that, that we are raising up leaders that are going to be beneficial to our community? I mean, it's far too long that we have seen people elected have never did anything to improve our community at that time and this time, either, very few. So how can we raise up people like Congressman Thompson to be an asset to our community instead of a burden to our community? Well, what do we have to do, I'm asking the question, to make sure we galvanize great leaders in the state of Mississippi so we can move the state forward? I believe that our people have to understand Power comes from the grassroots. It comes from the bottom up, not the top down. And for every community, there must be an agenda in terms of what's the needs of the community. Now, we got a commonality running all throughout the state for all of us. We, 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 we're constantly done injustice. We need uh, 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 the police to stop killing us. And we need economic reforms, not just handouts or allocations. We need to develop more businesses in the black community. We need opportunities for business development and growth. We need better housing in our communities instead of these rundown rental shacks and slum lords that lord over all these communities. So we got we got to find all of the issues that would make quality of life better. That each councilman, uh, uh, supervisor. Uh, or state representative or state senator can take the needs and concerns of their community to city hall or to the county courthouse or to uh, Jackson, Mississippi itself. But it's up to us as being leaders who's pushing this black power, this black liberation initiative. It's up to all the cadres to make sure that who has our political interests, who has our sociological and biological interests, 
uh, to make sure that they're on these ballots and to make sure that the people, and I say that the people, approve these agendas. And once the people approve these agendas, that the people, we make sure that they get out to vote. We make sure that the absentee ballots are done in the respective communities. And we bring these people into office and we hold them accountable to our agenda. Mm -hmm. Great deal. Good deal. Well, look, we have all ran our time, but we actually control our time. So we it don't matter if we be a little extended. I want to look at Sherry Darlene Bay coming. You see it on the screen right there. It said it's time to destroy the, destroy the whole, whole damn, system. damn system. Well, how, how is that done? Because like I said, you know, I think white people are very adamant. It ain't nothing wrong with their system. And, and, and that's the, and that's the thing that's that's the perspective that we need to look at you know white people don't see it ain't nothing wrong with the system as it stands for white people it. so brother Molly, i think you yes okay. yeah you good there's nothing wrong with the system to white people the predominant people of this land the dominant culture is nothing wrong with their system so what do black people do about it? If we can't control our own little townships, how do we destroy a system as magnificently built with all the mechanisms and the machinery of white supremacy? How do we do that? See, we're talking concepts and, and theory. How do we, that practically happen? I mean, because I think about this. I mean, seriously, I think about this. How do we destroy a system that can kill black children and then craft laws called qualified immunity and say, well, I was just doing my job and I'm white and I can go home. How do you destroy that system when it's constantly getting done? So what we saying, we, what is our role in that system? Do we not See, just remove yeah. ourselves? I'm going to let you respond, Bob. I'm going to let you respond, Bob. Bob, uh, Molly. Let you respond. But I want to get the question out there. I want us to really think about this because, see, concept is not going to stop. We're going to have to have some pragmatism, something practical. See, we go up there and we teach every Sunday. Then we walk out into a reality of white supremacy. We walk in white folks' stores. We go to white folks' schools. We live in white people's social dynamics. And we craft these ideas of how we destroy a system. How do we actually do that when it worked for the predominant? So what I'm saying, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying let's stop conceptualizing and let's get to a reality. We're talking about shifting a paradigm for a new black reality. So we have to think about some things that we have to do, some things that we have to build, some systems that we have to create ourselves that work for black people. And we got to be specific about our black. When they were crafting this system, they were specific about where black people are supposed to be in. Okay? You're supposed to be the burden bear, the debt uh, slave, the chattel slave. So if you remove yourself from that position and build your own system, then what happens to that system? If you remove yourself from that bottom row, that broad, bottom level, and start to build your own. And, and like y'all saying, I see Brother Caleb saying the same thing, a spiritual awakening in your mind. And every 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 uh, uh, action is preceded by thought. So if we're thinking pragmatic and, and, and for self and black power, we should be able to create that reality. Brother Martin. Well, you know, in the United States of America right now, every year, Black Americans spend over two trillion dollars here in America. Only way that we can really change the system is controlling our dollars to keep them, to make the system come back to us. We spend, we spend, we spend, and we don't own a lot in America. You know, some people own some things, some people don't. But the thing about it is, until we control our dollar. We cannot make a drastic change here in America with a new system. 
if you shed that two trillion dollar down per year, uh, spend it in a direct location, stores that we're going to spend it in, and I think we can bring some people to the table. But right now, we don't have the bargain power unless we change that dollar. I mean, control that dollar because the white man knows one thing: when you hit his pockets, that's his God. When when you control that dollar, you control his God. And you're controlling his future. Until we find out how to do that, the system will never be changed in the way we want it to, to benefit our people that live in the United States of America. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> we're going to get ready to bring it to a close tonight, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, but I want to leave us with this thought, and Baba Kamal, you're going to close us out, not me. It's nine areas of battle, okay? They were crafted by social scientists that understand our dilemma way better than we do. Mm. You know, you got people like Neely Fuller, okay? You got people like Francis Chris Wilson, who studied the social dynamics and the psychology of our condition. And they crafted the, 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 the premise that it's nine areas of battle. So I'm hearing uh, Baba Motley. And in this book right here, we will shoot back. It talks about our economic success in boycotting in certain situations right here in Mississippi. It talks about the leadership of athlete Skip Robinson in boycotting, but that's one aspect. That's one aspect. The economic aspect is one aspect. And what I've seen from this, we get what we want from white people for a period of time, and they go back to their ways. So the real thing is, why are we boycotting white people when we should be building and, 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 and uh, not just we, 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 we retracting our money from white people, I'm just giving a thought, but actually shifting the way we spend our money. This, this changes the paradigm, not taking my money from white people for a period of time till you do something uh, right on behalf of me, but changing the whole way that we look at economics. That's where the whole term group economics come from. The whole term group economics. And by the way, what about the educational system? You know, at some point we're gonna have to change that too because we got young black people coming out, consumer capitalists. That's all they are. They wanna consume. You know, they wanna cross the picket line. They wanna buy. Buy and give them value. So if we're not crafting schools, like the Ashe Academy, that's teaching our children how to the, the, create a reality with their dollar, you know, how to build value with their dollar, and not just the education on the economic, the politics as well. All of these things work simultaneously, simultaneously together to form this reality that we're talking about. We're not talking about big and white people to do right. They have proved to us that they don't have the moral character to treat us right. It's woven into the social fabric of America that they're not going to do us right. So it's up to us to respond to our own humanity and be men and women our own self and grow up and stop being little white people in black skin, begging for the crumbs that fall off master tape and figuring out which one of us going to get the biggest crumb. You know, so at some point we have to mature to that point, just like they did. When they crafted this country, you think about people like Patrick Henry. You think about people that uh the beginning forefathers of this country. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have jobs. Their sole purpose was how do we build a nation? They had skills. They were they were gun uh uh uh, uh blacksmiths. And, and, and farmers, and they learned, they stole, and they stole, they did what they had to do to build a nation for them, by them. And that's what we're living in the throes of. And at some point, we got to become men and women, grown men and women, that's going to determine our own reality. Bob Kamal, take us up out of here. Uh, I, I want to thank all the brothers and sisters across the country for tuning in to this video. 
uh, I'm going to ask those that are watching to share this video, put this on many platforms as you possibly can. We're trying to get our viewership up for Black Liberation Movement. If you can, donate to the movement, the cash app running down on the bottom of the screen. It takes money to run a movement. But lastly, I want to say this. We're going to have to come together. We're going to have to let the light-skinned Negro stop being against the dark skin. We're going to have to let the old stop being against the young. We're going to have to let the male stop being against the female. All these things are contributing to our shame, suffering, and death and our continued slavery. And I just quoted to you some passages from the Willie Lynch letter, which means that our slavery would happen perpetually. That means forever and ever and ever and ever. We're going to have to stop these menticides that we commit on one another. Come together in unity. I didn't say uniformity. We don't all have to look alike, but we all can work and strive toward the same purpose. Call 662-560-3454. 662-560-3454. Join Black Liberation Movement. Find out what you can do in terms of this initiative. Come join us at the rally August 26th in Jackson, Mississippi. By the way, we didn't even talk about the poison water supply down there and uh, the governor of Mississippi trying to wrestle Jackson, Mississippi away from our brother, Chuck Way Lumumba, which we'll get into at a later date. But we have work to do. Help us. Help us to help ourselves. August 26th, 2 p.m. That's on a Friday. Meet me there beat me there right in front of the attorney general's office september 16th through the 18th senatobia mississippi the black power summit needs you to be there and with that thank all of you all for joining us we leave you in the greetings of peace ashe assalamu alaikum peace but let me let me say this bob can i say this before we go go ahead go Yes, sir. I, I, I ask you, I know how you feel about that, but I just want to say this because it's on my spirit. And I want to I want to say this. Chuck Whaler Moomer, that, that man right back there, okay? He was approached by the Nation of Islam one particular time when he went into Holly Spring, Mississippi and did a magnificent feat because a lot of us don't know that Chuck Way was a great attorney. And he represented black people with power. I know Chuck Way was the only attorney I know that could go into parts of Mississippi and see his client any time that he felt like he needed to. Any time. Okay? But he was opposed by the Nation of Islam after he pulled a magnificent feat and freed a brother in Holly Springs, Mississippi that had uh, uh, defended himself and, 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 and against a white man and killed him. And Chuck Way freed that brother. And he was approached by the Nation of Islam because the Nation of Islam brought Chuck Way in. And they asked Brother Chuck Way, they said, uh, we need you to join the Nation of Islam. And Brother Lamuma told them, he said, y'all don't hate white people enough. Okay? He said, y'all don't hate white people enough. Now, I'm not saying that for us to feel some type of way. But what I'm saying that for is for this. Chuck Way internalized something. He understand that the system came out of the mind of me. So what right. he was saying, you don't hate white people in this system enough to do what I have done. To do what I have done. To be able to educate myself to walk into these systems and destroy them. Get our brothers and sisters out of the grips of these devils and these system building people that diametrically oppose us. I wanted to say that because Chuck Way did what we talk about. He created the skill set to deal with what we talk about. And he not only that, he went on down to Jackson, Mississippi, and he ascertained the highest political office in Jackson. That's because of what he believed and what he knew. And the only thing I'm saying, with respect to Bob Kamal, because I did ask him to close it out, let us get that. Let us get that spirit about ourselves. Like John Henry Clark said, take what you do best and use it for your people. 
and the liberation of black people. We got to remember that. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Brother Motley. Thank you, Baba Kamal, for tuning in. And I and I and I hate that we didn't get to Jahi Ashe because that young brother is sticking real close and tight with the Black Liberation Movement and what it is that he's leading the BYLC, the Black Youth Leadership Coalition, the future leaders of the state of Mississippi and the Black reality in Mississippi. Jahi Ashe, you stay strong, brother. We didn't get to you tonight, but know that we love you. We love you, and you represent our next generation. Thank you. Thank y'all for tuning in tonight. Peace and power. Peace and power.